Alrighty, folks, so today uh, we're going to talk about volcanoes. I've gone back and forth over the years on uh, proper spelling here, and you guys know I'm never a stickler for that, but I like to try whenever possible. It really seems like volcanoes ought to have an E in it at the end. Um, but seemingly it does not. You'll still see it that way, though, every so often when I pluralize it. I, I haven't corrected all of them. So for those of you that also appreciate fine spelling, <clears throat> I just thought I'd take a moment to, to point that out. So when you think of volcanoes, um, I'm sure the first thing that comes to mind is a giant smoky mountain. Or maybe lava rolling through a village and, and people running around and yelling. It depends, I suppose, how much uh, movies you've seen with volcanoes in them. Um, maybe the first thing that comes to mind is uh, Pompeii. Um, and dang it, I've got some pictures. A buddy of mine was uh, there over the summer. And I meant to uh, integrate some of those pictures into today's lecture. I still may pause and do that. We'll see. Um, but for most folks, you know, you have a mountain that is smoking. Uh, maybe you've got some uh, hobbits at the top of it throwing a ring in. It's, it's all up to the person, I suppose. Um, but all those images, regardless of how you picture a volcano, will have three things in common. Okay? And one of them is lava. Another is probably ash falling somewhere. And the other is gases. And you're like, wait a minute, I didn't picture any gases. Well, if you pictured smoke, okay, or people running around choking and so on and so forth, then that's gases. So when we talk about the three things that come out of volcano, that's the capital V, all right, um, you want to remember that. You want to remember lava, pyroclastic material, which is ash is one type of, and gases. We're going to talk about each of these three as we go through this lesson. And, um, and like I said, that pretty much everything we talk about will fall under one of these categories, or at least associated with. Now, please do not try to take down all this information on here. For one thing, it's, it's way too small for most of you to see. And for the other thing, it's, it's um, not irrelevant, but not important for our purposes. What is important are the pictures. And unfortunately, unless you look at the, uh, the scale bar very closely, they're way out of proportion. Um, turns out that top one, that appears to be the smallest of all three, is actually the largest. Uh, because you see that blue stuff? That's the ocean. All right. Um, that one actually starts growing on the ocean floor. These other two grow at the surface of the earth, uh, on, on the continents. So, uh, in order of bigness, it would go one, three, two. Okay. What we want to attach to this conversation are three names, okay? Um, we've got um, shield volcano. Shield like a Viking shield or a Roman soldier shield. Shield volcano. Actually, cone. Sorry, I usually say cone. I'm reading the slide. Um, shield cone. Uh, cinder cone with a C. Cinder with a C. and composite. And again, it doesn't really matter if you say cone or volcano. I'm just um, trying to use some proper terminology here. There are three types of volcanoes. Um, shield volcano, composite volcano, cinder volcano. But um, the cone is the word for the what we call a mountain, the volcano itself. Okay. 
So shield really does imply something. It gives you a, an, an image in your head. Um, if for some reason you can't picture a shield, uh, think of a trash can lid. Okay. It's very wide, broad, not too horribly steep, but there is a slope to it. Uh, whereas cinder cones uh, are much more like a, an ice cream cone. Okay, Very steep, very pointy. Um, if you were standing at the bottom of it, it would seem very tall, of course. But all this is, is relative, right? So we're saying, you know, compared to the other volcanoes, this is the smallest. But it still seemed big to you. And then composite, as the name may or may not imply to you, is a mixture of both. It has some of the properties of a shield volcano and some of the properties of a cinder volcano. So what, what are those properties? Well, shield volcanoes get this shape um, because they're composed primarily of lava and they're not too horribly explosive, uh, which allows them to not only blow themselves to smithereens with any frequency, so they get to build up a lot over time, but when they erupt, it just sort of flows out, rolls down the sides, they're typically just building events, if you would. Okay, they serve to enhance the structure. And, you know, what other way could you grow up from the ocean floor, if you think about it? All right, that takes tons and tons and tons of time. These are islands, okay? When you think of, and I'll just speak with regard to, to the Americas, there are many other volcanic islands out there. Um, but when you think of Hawaii, okay, um, I'd like to think you knew those were volcanoes, but... You know, when you think of Hawaii, do you think of a volcano? Not, not usually. You think of, you know, the palm trees, the beach, coconuts, so on and so forth. But the whole damn thing is a volcano. It's the top of a volcano that is sticking out of the ocean. Same could be said of Iceland. Okay, Iceland erupts with some frequency. So a lot of people know that Iceland is a volcano. Or more so, they think that it has volcanoes. But Iceland is a giant volcano. It just has you know, randomly active vents here and there. So anyhow, those are shield codes, okay? You only see, you know, we'll borrow a term from another field, you know, the tip of the iceberg with these things. They're not going to seem huge and mountainous to you, all right? That's because 95% of them is, is underwater, but they're giant. Cinder cone, on the other hand, uh, as we said, grows at the surface of the earth, and they actually grow rather quickly. But these are nasty, gassy, sputtery, horrific things. Um, a cinder is another type of pyroclast. We mentioned ash a couple minutes ago, right? Uh, so imagine this just spitting out these sort of ashy fireballs that are piling up around this, this whole event in the, in the uh, earth. And those, those pile up rather quickly. They fuse together because, you know, molten rock sort of stuff. As it cools, it fuses together, and, and, you, and you make this, this cone. Um, as I said, unfortunately, because they're, they're so chock full of gases and, and whatnot, they're very volatile. And they quite frequently you know, blow off half the side of themselves and, and so on and so forth. Uh, they grow very quickly. They disappear just as quickly. Um, I always remember this, this story in a kid's book I had when I was a little kid. It was you know, natures of the world, some sort of thing, you know. And uh, the typical story of um, these farmers going out to their field the next morning to find a volcano had, had grown overnight and, and so on. So that's one of these guys, okay. And it quite likely, you know, may be gone two weeks later because it blows itself up. So nasty things. So whereas the others were lava, these use pyroclastic materials. And hopefully you could imagine the cone shape as a function of that. If you've ever played with sand or played with rocks, think back to when you were a little kid. You know, your, your slope, your angle of incline is uh, really dependent on the material that you use. You can't make really steep things out of sand, right? It tends to just roll down. But if you've got bigger grain sizes, you know, these, these pyroclasts, they can build up, stack up better. 
So, as I said, the composite then is a mixture of both of these. Okay, you've got the you've got the uh, occasional lava flows that help you build these great big cones, and then you've got these nasty explosions that make it something you don't really want to live near. <coughs> Doesn't alternate necessarily, you know. Lava, cinder, lava, cinder, lava, cinder. Just at any given eruption, you could get one or either. Yeah? I think I heard somewhere that volcanic ash is, has like a bunch of nutrients in it. Mm -hmm. like Possibly in our video the other day. Um, yeah, it is. I mean, well, think about it. We, we haven't, um, well, we did talk about igneous rocks. I say we haven't started igneous rocks yet, but um, this semester we did talk about igneous rocks. And what, um, what are igneous rocks made out of? Just loosely speaking, bunch of, different minerals. bunch of different minerals, and those bunch of different minerals are made out of elements, right? So that ash is the same stuff. So yeah, it would definitely be soil rich. Think about um, some of your best grape countries in the world. All right, they're right at the bases of volcanoes and stuff. So amazingly good soil, but there's a price to pay for it. Yes, ma'am. Yes. That's we're going to talk about that in a minute. Excellent question. So the other thing I want you to know about all these, thank you for the segue, is uh, some examples of where these guys are located. Okay. So shield cones, I already rattled off a couple. You may not have got it at the moment. Um, think Hawaiian Islands. Okay, right off the bat, um, nice big volcanic island. And again, there's many more. Uh, throughout the world, depending on your background, you may be more or more more or less familiar with some of them. Cinder cones, we don't have a location for. Cinder cones can go anywhere, anytime. They could grow on the side of a, another volcano. Okay, so we don't really have a location for those. But composites, we spend a lot of time talking about um, because composites are the ones that you've heard about. So Vesuvius comes to mind. Mount Fuji comes to mind. Um, Etna, all the village obliterating volcanoes of lore, if you spend any time studying ancient Europe and Asia, okay, and Africa. Uh, I don't know if we mentioned Krakatoa yet. Um, um, there, there, there's just so many. The ones you've heard of, okay, these are your composites. They're big, they're at the surface, and almost all of them have erupted within the last couple hundred years, if not, you know, longer. Vesuvius Pompeii was a lot longer a lot longer ago. Um, I can't remember the exact date, like 9 AD or something. It was a long time ago. But because of the way it preserved everything, everyone still knows it, you know. Um, what most people don't know is this is this, this the funniest, for lack of a better word, part of it, is that's what we have in North America as well. They just, thank goodness, aren't horribly eruptive at the moment. Mount St. Helens, which you've heard of, I hope, is one of those. But all the others down the chain of the, down the west coast, there's an entire chain of active volcanoes, and we'll talk about those in a couple minutes. Uh, mount Rainier. Okay, I just grew up thinking that was a mountain that people tried to climb. Well, it was a volcano. Okay, and Mount Hood and Mount Shasta, a handful of others. If you pay attention to such things, again, you'll know their names, but you might not have known they were volcanoes. Uh, lastly, and this is just little factoids here, um, your shield cones, we want you to assimilate, uh, or assimilate, associate basalt, basaltic lavas, okay? Uh, again, we might have talked about this, I know it came up in at least one of the labs, uh, or maybe it was in lecture, the black sand beaches of, of Hawaii, okay, that's one of the things that's uh, some of the places, not everywhere in Hawaii, but many of the places, are uh, famous for, okay? And that's because uh, the island itself is made of basalt, and when the waves batter that, it turns it into black sand, all right? So basaltic for, um, for shield volcanoes. And uh, that's also part of the thing. We, we get into the chemistry a little bit later, um, but you remember Bowen's reaction series and the two sides of that, and they, we talked about there were mafic lavas and felsic lavas. 
the felsics tend to be a lot more nasty and sputterier. The, the basaltics are more mellow, for lack of a better word. Okay, and again, this is why you could go to Hawaii and take a helicopter tour if you have enough money uh, and go hiking on the volcanoes and all that stuff because it's not very likely to blow up tourists. Now, if you paid attention, Maui over the summer, I believe it was Maui, they had a hell of a big uh, problem there, okay? Um, there was some, a uh, lot of stuff lost to, to volcanoes. Um, so, anywho, uh, that aside, uh, it's generally safe, for lack of a better word. Um, we don't have a, a lava type for cinders. Again, it could be anything, anywhere. But composites, those are um, the intermediate igneous rocks. So if you were to go to Mount St. Helens and whack a hunk of it off, it should be, who remembers their extrusive intermediate igneous rock? Yeah, we only mentioned it in passing, but andesite, okay? Andesitic is what we would say. Basaltic for shields, and andesitic, andesite, A-N-D-E-S-I-T-E, in case you don't know how to spell andesite. Basalt's a lot easier to spell. So a lot of stuff. Okay, just on this one little slide here, we've been talking for probably 10 minutes. So lots of notes on that slide. All right, so now we're going to take to that point where we talk about, you know, sort of the three things that come out of volcanoes. Just a little introduction there. Lava. Isn't it pretty? It's really pretty. Um, this slide is ancient. I've probably had this slide in my collection since I've been teaching. Uh, I don't even remember what textbook it's from. Let's see here. Yeah, at least they credited the geologist that took the picture. Oh, McGraw-Hill. Good God, yeah, I haven't used McGraw-Hill in, in decades. Um, but it's a beautiful picture. So what kind of rock is that, it looks like, in the background? It's black, it's igneous, it's basalt. basalt. Good job. So more than likely this is in Hawaii. We don't know. There's basalts other places, too. But, you know, it's a typical place for someone to go take pictures like this. And you got that beautiful molten rock. It looks like a fountain. Maybe not at the mall, but Disney would make something like this, right? Um, very cool. Very nice. you got the eruption in the background there. And I just let it be that for years. Until one semester somebody asked me, what, what is an odd thing about this, this picture? An odd thing, yeah. Strange. Out of place, maybe. The yeah, the trees. They're like, um, how are there still trees there? a great question. They're obviously not doing so well. All right. Um, uh, I grew up in watching Bugs Bunny. I know it's a little removed for you guys, but uh, one of the gags in Bugs Bunny always once someone got blown up or shot or whatever they did, all the lovely violence in Bugs Bunny cartoons, um, they would still be sitting there glaring at you till you walked over and touched them and then they'd just go shh to ash and, and fall to the floor. That might be the case. It with these trees. You know, they're good until the wind blows and they're gone. What more than likely happened is slowly but surely the bases got encased and they just kind of protected the tree itself from, from burning up one way, shape, or form or another. But yeah, it's really, and that may be why the guy took the picture, you know? Because oh my gosh, look at that. There's just two trees just standing there. Third one, I believe. Where's, oh, off to the side. I see that little branch there. Well, there now, I learned something new about my slide again after all these years. All right, so lava. We've seen it. We know what it looks like, all right? And you guys know that there's the three flavors, right? We talked about this already. We've got three kinds of igneous rocks. You've got three, excuse me, three kinds of lavas or magmas. But we're at the surface now, so we use the word lava over and over and over again. So you've got mafic lavas. You've got felsic lavas. And you've got those wonderful mixture of intermediates in the middle. As we implied, this is more than likely a mafic lava because it's basalt. It looks like it should be basalt. So lava, three kinds, three chemistries. I call them flavors. I like to make things a little easier for you guys. 
Now, within one of those chemistries, and it happens to be the basaltics, I'm sorry, the, the, the mafix, we want to talk about two types. We've got this one and this one, okay? Now, just a quick survey here. How would you pronounce that? Fahoho. Fahoho, right. And that's what I said for years. Fahoho. It sounds silly, but whatever. It's fahoho. Okay. It's not, you know, not my word. I didn't make it. Well, one day I was showing a video with some folks who were in a position to know a lot better than I am. It turns out it's Pahoehoe. Which, okay, Pacific Islands, I, I, I could give them that. That makes a good bit more sense. So this is Pahoehoe. All right. This is, just as it sounds, ah, uh -uh. okay. So we have Pahoehoe lava and ah, uh -uh lava. Ah, uh -uh. Well, do they look like they're running away? They're actually waiting for the guy to get back with the marshmallows by the looks of it. Um, so ah, uh -uh, if you can't tell, is very thick, chunky, um, kind of like if the, there was a pile of asphalt moving down your street, okay, blacktop. Like these gentlemen uh, are doing, showing you here that they're, they're not in any danger at the moment. The only thing that's in danger are those shrubs. If there's another rock in the way, or you know, God forbid, somebody's house, you know, 50 yards down the road, stuff that can't move. But humans, animals, okay, not a whole bit, a lot of problems. We call this, your book refers to viscosities. When you're reading the igneous stuff, be it the uh, intrusive or the extrusive, we mainly talk about it with extrusive stuff. Uh, they talk about viscosity, viscous. Usually you think about that with, if you think about it at all, with oil, right? When you're doing your car or whatever. Uh, viscosity is a resistance to flow. So this is very viscous. It's very resistant to flow. Pahoehoe, on the other hand, well, this is like maple syrup. Pahoehoe supposedly means thin and, and ropey. And if you look at the foreground here, you don't really see that. You see a puddle. Uh, maybe it looks like wax starting to dry. But if you look in the background of this picture, it looks like roots from a tree, maybe. And what's happening, again, is the surface is cooling, but underneath it is still flowing. And that gives it an amazing texture. This stuff, yeah, you might not want to stand in front of and roast marshmallows. It could ooze out any given moment. It might even pop and sputter and spatter a little bit. And like I said, what's, what's kind of important here, this isn't a volcanology class. Again, that is something you could take an entire semester on. It's something you could get a doctorate in even, all right? But it is worth pondering for a moment that in class, you guys are going to see one hunk of rock, and every group is going to get the same hunk of rock. And if you're online, you get a picture, and trust me, it looks like all the other pictures, or it looks like all the other rocks that we show. You're going to see this is basalt, okay? But what I want you to ponder for a minute is if once this hardens versus once that stuff hardens, are they going to look like the same rock? Yeah, probably not. I haven't really been able to find. I, I want to say I, I, I looked <coughs> for some images of, of hardened pohoihoi and, and hardened uh -uh, cool, crystallized, whatever you want to call it. But I think I would have integrated the, the pictures. That's why if, if you saw earlier, I was kind of poking around looking to see if I had another lecture that was more updated than 2020. Because I thought I looked. Because um, that's been bugging me for a while now. And, and not, you know, just wondering, well, what we have one type in the classroom and you know, just making sure you guys realize that, you know, these rocks grow. They're, they're a function of their environment. Uh, we really stress that with sedimentary, but with volcanic stuff, you know, they too. Uh, there is variation. So, anyhow, Pahoehoe and uh, uh, both types of basalt, both types of uh, mafic igneous rocks, okay, both originally lava. 
<coughs> excuse me, and both associated with Hawaiian Island type eruptions. This is actually a screenshot from a video. I, I didn't make the screenshot. <coughs> what they're doing here is they're timing the lava flow. They're actually pacing it out. He puts a chalk mark down, takes X number of paces or strides, and then they time how long the, uh, the lava takes to overcome that. So they're doing some research here. They're not just some locals standing around. They're doing science. But somebody is off at the truck getting marshmallows, I'm sure. All right. Switching gears again. And this is another thing that I swear I added a diagram for. So you guys are just going to have to mentally picture this and draw it on your, uh, your notes. So again, imagine you're back in like third grade or whatever and you're doodling and you're drawing a nice little volcano. So let's start with the most important part, of course, and that is the cone. So draw your nice little upside down triangle. Or, or Well, it's not upside down. It's upside down if you think of an ice cream cone, I suppose. So you got your little triangle there, the mountain, and what did we say we call that? Not a mountain, but a cone, yes. All right, so write the word cone and point to your triangle. Now, I want you to take the top off of that triangle. <laughs> Purpose to tell you that afterwards. How many of you are writing in pencil, though? Good for you. Like you took a bite out of that ice cream cone. All right. Because we need the hole at the top. That hole at the top is called a crater. Now you're going to realize that it's a cross-section of a volcano, and you're not just looking at it as an outsider. You're actually seeing a scientific cross-sectional drawing because in the middle of that crater, we're going to draw a tube that goes all the way down to the bottom of your volcano and then some. And at the very bottom of that is a pool of magma or lava. Right, Draw a big circle at the bottom of that vent pipe. Holy cow, I actually have colored chalk. Unfortunately, it's on a green board. I don't know how colorful it will be. Green? Do I have green? This hasn't erupted yet, so we still have grass next to it. No, I don't have green. So that tube is called the vent, probably said that, I think I said that. The pool at the bottom is called a magma chamber. And sometimes you'll see the word pluton. I, Plutons are really big. We're making a nice little singular, unique volcano here. So we're just going to call it a magma chamber. So the way this grew, okay, is some, some magma escaped from the mantle, worked its way up into the crust, and over time, worked its way to the surface. All right. So on day one, of course, that cone wasn't there. That vent pipe was really just a crack in the ground. Over time, hundreds and hundreds of years, thousands of years, who knows, all right, that built up. The vent pipe remains in the center because, you know, pressure and stuff keeps it there. And the cone built up around it. Yes, the majority of the volcanoes you see in pictures are nice and pointy top. That happens, okay. But uh, this one, of course, we made for um, uh, descriptive purposes. We made a nice big old hole in it. This is 
again, the kind you could climb to the top and throw whatever you need to sacrifice into it, I suppose. So cone, crater, vent or vent pipe, and magma chamber. Got them? Those are your vocabulary words. Probably didn't draw it this way. I didn't. Um, but what I want you to think of, this, this crater at the top really is like a funnel. All right? It helps you really picture what's going on there. And it also helps, you know, when you think about those silly Hollywood movies where they are climbing up to the top and there's the bubbling lava down at the bottom. And actually, I'm going to show you a really cool video uh, at the end of the lecture um, that's set up in the same way. And, and that's exactly what this sort of looks like. You could even, I think, I could see the vent pipe in the center there. All right, it goes down that slope, and then there's that dark bit where I think that's the vent pipe is. What we want to draw your attention to next, however, is that lovely blue lake in the background. Very round lake. And we're not talking about the lake itself, but we're talking about the round hole in the ground. And that's a caldera. More specifically, a caldera is a collapsed volcano. All right. It is a giant hole, or at least ring, of debris that is the base of the cone. We'll show you an image a little later. Shows how that happens, how they form. But if the area is gets enough moisture, they do tend to fill up with, with water over time, and you get these beautiful round lakes. <coughs> this one is nice. I'm not sure how far away that is. It looks kind of close to this volcano, which brings up the conversation about magma pits versus plutons, right? These guys most probably share the same source. Just the one in the background blew itself to smithereens sometime in the past, and this one in the foreground is much more recent. But um, this one happens to fit in frame, okay? And it, it's kind of nice. Again, it's very picturesque. There's a reason um, Mr. Plummer took it there. But they're not always... <coughs> like this. Um, I remember in, in field camp, I haven't told a whole lot of field camp stories. They're, they're not like band camp stories, don't worry. But um, field camp is what you do your senior year of geology. Um, you spend all these years learning stuff. Uh, and in my case, in the middle of Ohio, where there's zero geology, except for the fact that glaciers plowed everything over. Um, so they send you out west, typically, to go look where there's actually geology, that wily e. coyote stuff. That, Pull out another bug spunny reference. So one day the teacher says, All right, everyone pile in the van. We're going to look at a caldera. We're like, Oh, sweet. I right, see a volcano, volcano that blew up. And da, 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 awesome. Very cool. So we drive out there, pulls over to the side of the road, and we all get out. And he just kind of stands there and smiles, looking around. And we're like, All right, I don't see a hole. We're not on the rim of anything or the edge of anything I, I don't and he knew exactly that's why he brought us there so very he puts out his finger into like a pointing thing and very slowly turns around and we realize that basically on the horizon for lack of a better word there is a ring around us the thing was massive massive um so these these things they have you know volcanoes could be huge and we, we never really realized that. Um, this is what sounds kind of weird, but I often get that same feeling down here in the valley. Uh, if you're in the right place around here, you could look to the north, you could look to the south, and you see that you're surrounded, okay, on both sides. And it, it's, it's sort of that same feeling we had, um, except it was out west and there were no trees and, and whatnot, very little topography in the middle of it. But I get that same feeling here every so often. So, scale is, scale can vary. So, caldera is the hole in the ground, collapsed volcano, crater, 
again the top of the volcano as seen in the image. All right. The Cascade Range. A little while ago I told you about the active chain of volcanoes in the continental U.S. It's important to say continental because we've got the Hawaiian Islands, right? And um, the Hawaiian Islands are not continental, but they are definitely, as mentioned, volcanoes. So this runs um, basically from Northern California all the way up into Canada. There's a very specific reason these guys are here. And it kind of peters out. What, what's the rest of California known for? Not volcanoes necessarily, but what? Earthquakes. Yeah. So something happens just after you get into California there that, that it changes. And we stop seeing volcanoes and instead we see earthquakes. All right. One of the first lectures we talked about, uh, we talked a little bit about plate tectonics and plate boundaries. And I mentioned that the west coast of North America is the edge of our plate. The Pacific Ocean is on its own plate. So this is a plate boundary. And this is a very specific type of plate boundary uh, called a subduction zone. And I apologize, I don't have that spelled out for you. Uh, imagine you're spelling subdue. Okay, but just put an uction on the end of it. A subduction zone. And what's happening here is that these two plates are coming together. And the ocean plate is losing. So continental and oceanic plate are coming together. For those of you at home, I'm pushing my two hands together. And the fingers of one hand are going down underneath my other hand. All right, I'm sort of touching the knuckles of one hand with my fingers and the other fingers are tickling my palm underneath. So it's this oceanic plate that loses and goes down. So as it's going down into the earth, of course, it's going to remelt. Well, what's also going down there is a whole hell of a lot of ocean water, right? Water and fire, you might think that's a pretty good idea. I want you to think more so water and grease. What happens with water and grease? Yeah, not good, right? All right, it acts much in the same way. This water, this ocean water, doesn't put out the molten rock. It mixes with it, and that hydrogen and oxygen, the water vapor, because it just evaporates almost immediately, turns us into a bubbling, nasty cauldron of stuff. Again, I think I brought up this question already, and not too many hands went up. If you've ever cooked at a restaurant and you throw something into the fryer fresh out of the freezer, those ice crystals are even worse than water because the energy change from going from ice to gas is, is insane. Um, but that crackling, bubbling noise, okay, imagine that going on. But I use my hands for a very specific reason because that isn't happening at the boundary itself. Look where my fingertips are. Remember I said they're practically under the, the, my palm? Those volcanoes aren't on the coastline. They're in. So it takes a while for that to kick in and make that bubbly, nasty mess. So they are there because of the plate boundary, but they're not right on the plate boundary. Whereas a little farther down, when we switch to the earthquake activity, and, and that's a function of the shape of the plates, Plate's still moving in the same direction, okay? It's just that it happens to be shaped slightly differently down there, and, and we don't get going underneath. We get a sort of a rubbing side-by-side, side, and that rubbing side-by-side, side, if you've ever walked down the hallway and sort of dragged your pencil or your hand along the brick wall, and it goes, bubble, 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 okay? That's the earthquake -y part. It gets its own chapter. We'll talk about it later. But... Just so you understand, that's still the plates are moving. They just move a little differently down there. So by now, as you're listening to me blather on here, you're bored and you're reading the names, hopefully you recognize a few of those names on there. And you're like, oh, I didn't know those were volcanoes. Oh, oh. You recognize a handful of them. 
again, if you paid attention to any kind of stuff like that throughout, you know, as you were growing up. Some people do, some people don't. And you recognize some of those cities. Some of those cities are quite close to some potentially active volcanoes. Mm. So, anyhow, Cascade Range, okay? These are all considered active. Potentially any one of them could erupt at any given day. They're moderating the hell out of them, believe me. Looking for steam and bulges and whatnot. And these days we've got GPS units on them and satellite things so we can tell. They used to use lasers because um, the laser would bounce back and come and come back in a certain amount of time. And if the size of the volcano changed, the time that it bounces back would change. So that used to be state of the art. Nowadays, eh, they might still use the lasers, but nowadays it's all GPS and satellite stuff. You don't want to lose the volcano. Well, you don't want to lose the town around the volcano, really. No. But so Cascade Range, and again, these are what type of volcano? Told you a little while ago. Mm -hmm. Composite, that one, the mixture, the bad ones that you don't want to be next to. Okay. But we've been fairly lucky in that they've been not too detrimental. So we've moved in nice and close. It's just like, you know, we do all the time. It's pretty, so we build houses there. We do it on um, rivers. We do it on cliffs. We do it everywhere. We do it on fault lines. Uh, we do it everywhere we shouldn't do. Uh, that's because Mother Nature quite typically is well-behaved. Not always. Johnny Cash song aside, you've hopefully heard of the Ring of Fire. And um, it, it seems in this picture much more like a horseshoe of fire. All right. It looks uh, like wrinkles in the water, but it looks all like mountain. Yeah, it's topography, yeah. yeah. Some high spots, some low spots. There's a lot of it in, like, inside yeah. the Ring of Fire. Yeah. Ring of fire. Yeah, yeah, it's catchy now. Too. Those of you who know the song, sorry, I got it stuck in your head. Um, so, yeah, it looks like the Horseshoe of Fire. Uh, the Ring of Fire is the most uh, volcanically and earthquakingly, if you'll allow me to conjugate as such, uh, active area in the world. Uh, it's essentially the boundary of the Pacific Plate. Um, it's also known, not quite so eloquently, as the Circum-Pacific Belt. Circum means around. Um, so it is the Around the Pacific Belt. And uh, basically it runs, as you can see, down the west coast of North America, through Central America, uh, west coast of South America, down into Antarctica, uh, back up around, up through the uh, east coast-ish of Australia, and into Asia. It is a mess over there. Uh, there's a bunch of little microplates over there. Um, you see where uh, Krakatoa and Tambora and, and Mayan and Pinatubo and, and all that stuff. Um, there's there's a bunch of little plates going on over there, okay? Um, but more or less, the boundary still runs down there. And um, that portion of the world is unfortunately very active. Um, uh, horribly active. So they get more, I see more earthquakes. In the time I've been paying attention, last 30 so or so years, uh, the volcanoes. But either way, um, it's, it's just a mess. Up through the top there, uh, as we jump from Asia to North America, we've got, um, uh, for those of you that know your geography, we've got the Aleutian Islands, okay? Uh, or you didn't know what that word there says or pronounces. Uh, it's the Aleutian Islands. That is a chain of volcanic islands. Um, not exactly connected. Uh, you heard the land bridge, though, right? Remember, you learned about that in one of your classes, I'm sure. Uh -huh. uh, that was a function when sea level was lower because of glaciation. Um, that was that was all part of that area up there. Um, those are formed in a slightly different manner. Uh, up there, the plate is pulling apart. And so these guys just kind of bubble up like they're cut on your arm. Or your leg, all right. It just it just comes out because the the, the wound is open, 
Um, so the Aleutian Islands are formed in that manner. So Ring of Fire is the most volcanically active place on the planet. Uh, jump over to just above Africa there. Uh, you see Etnis, Thera, Vesuvius. Uh, that is the Circum-Mediterranean belt. And luckily spelling is not important because I half the time can't even spell Mediterranean. Um, that is the second most active place. All right. And again, those are your 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 village obliterating ones of, of, of uh, lore there. Um, really active over there. Again, more often than not, you're going to hear about earthquakes, but they certainly have a very volcanic past. A couple more things in passing. Uh, Kilimanjaro there, east coast of Africa. Africa's an amazing place ge geologically. Um, one of the things about it is you, you look across that whole continent and you see very little blue, very little blue, right? Until you get over to the east coast and it's just all over the place. Uh, it's, it's a rift, what we call it. And a rift is kind of like a tear. Um, a lot of folks know that Madagascar, the little island off to the side there, uh, used to be attached to uh, Africa. If you slide it down just a little bit, it, it falls right into place there like a puzzle piece. Not everyone knows that India also used to be a hunk of Africa. If you pluck India down, turn it uh, counterclockwise, it would plug right in um, where... Uh, um, Madagascar is as well. So that whole area is is ripping apart. Again, there's so many little microplates over there. Um, not really sure why India traveled so much more faster than Madagascar. Uh, it's like the last 60 million years India has gone from Africa up into Asia. And it's still hauling ass. Um, we know that because what's between India and the rest of Asia? Uh, the largest mountain in the world. The largest, tallest mountain chain and still growing, the Himalayas. Yeah. All right. India trying to join Asia is is causing this huge mountain chain to just keep growing. And, and again, it's all, geologically speaking, fairly recent. Um, so there's, there's some serious, crazy geology going on in that little part there. But in the middle of it all, because it's being ripped apart, is the mighty Kilimanjaro. Um, the only other thing I want to mention, again, we talked about the Hawaiian Islands. Okay, right dead center in the middle of the Pacific Plate, nowhere near a plate boundary, uh, we see the Hawaiian Islands. They are there, they are volcanoes for a different reason. Uh, they are there because essentially of the way we drew this silly little isolated volcano a couple minutes ago. The pool of magma worked its way up to the surface, and it's just been making the volcano. As it turned out, it's rather important. Uh, there's a chain of islands, uh, six large ones, I think, come to mind, and I couldn't name them if I had to, I apologize. Uh, they go off to the northwest. And the interesting thing about them is that uh, the further northwest you go, the older the mountains become, I'm sorry, the islands become, and also the less active. So what they figured out is that there's this pool of magma underneath, which they call a hot spot. I'm not very creative, uh, but that's our magma chamber, all right? And what this ended up being, before we had all this amazing satellite data, was uh, some early proof for plate tectonics. The, north, the Pacific plate is moving northwesterly, okay? So what's happening is that the, the plate itself is sitting over this giant pool of magma. Apparently it's made six islands at this point. And slowly but surely, it's sliding over the hot spot. As it slides over the hot spot, it's no longer on the burner, if you will. So that island's done. It moves off to the side, works on a new one. That slides off. Thousands and thousands and thousands of years we're doing this. There's actually a new one being formed now as the current island is moving off. It's called Loiki. They've named it already. Um, but it'll be, again, a very long time before it 
breaks the water and we can sell plane tickets to there then. You can own planes. You don't. All right. Questions? We didn't mention the Caribbean. Caribbean also has a plate. You see Mount Pele, probably heard of Pele. Um, Super Area Hills is another one. Um, again, in our time, they've been more known for earthquakes than volcanoes, but very active over there as well. Yes, sir. Is there a reason why Yellowstone is so big? It's, it's a volcano. So right? big? Uh, just, it's big. Uh, but it is there. The, go for the other part of that question. Um, it is a caldera. Yellowstone Park is a caldera. So um, there was a volcano, or perhaps a couple, um, there. I'm not going to, I'm just going to generically say thousands of years in the past. I don't know when it was, unfortunately. Um, blew itself to smithereens. But the fact that that water boils, the geysers happen, the mud pots, all the amazing yeah. stuff that's there. There's still magma under there heating up the groundwater. Yeah. Um, Discovery Channel, uh, once they veered uh, into entertainment um, instead of strictly science, and not that science can't be entertaining, but you guys know what I mean. Yeah. They put out that scared movie, um, Super Volcano or something like that. And um, yeah, in theory, uh, any given day. Yellowstone National Park could explode. Um, so please don't let that stop you from going there. I know that sounds bizarre, but it is an amazing place. You would literally think you were on Venus if it weren't for the tourists. I had the luck to spend an afternoon there a long time ago. Does it have, um, they have like huge uh, lakes of like sulfur? It it's, it's, yeah, I mean, you, you really can't. There's these different colored lakes that are actually water but colored. There's mud pits that are colored. There's the geysers. Um, I, I had a video I used to show in class. I don't have the time anymore somehow. I don't know how I lost the time. But um, it really is an amazing place. And, and please, if you ever have the opportunity to get there, uh, do so. But yeah, it is. I mean, there's a reason it's there. And that is that it's chock full of magma underneath. Um, again, most times, it just gives a little earthquakey rumble and they'll close off that part of the park so they're sure that everything has settled down. But it's monstrous, it's huge. I don't know, do you happen to know, remember how many miles it is? You know it's big, but... I want to say something, no, like, nah, I was thinking 500 for some reason. <coughs> so, yeah, that, that seems large, but it's big. Remember 500. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't even know if Siri knows. What's the size of Yellowstone National Park? Good. If we were both way off, 3,468 square miles. Oh, wow. Yeah, so 500 was low. Yeah, 3,500 square miles. It, it, I'm going to go for a couple volcanoes. We're there. So if we, like, you know how volcanoes erupt because of a buildup of pressure, right? Right. So if you were to, like, drill into a volcano to relieve the pressure, would that just cause it to prematurely explode, or? That's a good question. Um. I don't think there's any, if that were a pending threat somewhere, I'm guessing we would have tried it. Because we've tried to lubricate earthquakes. <laughs> All right. Um, so letting off the steam isn't as, as crazy as it sounds at all. Um, but I haven't heard of anything like that. I mean, in theory, you certainly could. But it would be the equivalent of, you know, opening up that, that bag of microwave popcorn and it, it, right out of the thing and that, that steam, everything just comes right out at you. Yeah, it w wouldn't be the safest. Yeah, it wouldn't be the safest. But again, in theory, it would be safer than letting the whole thing go off. My guess is that nothing is is at the boiling point, so to speak. Um, that we've got, you know, some mad scientists up there trying that right now. But we have tried, like I said, to lubricate uh, earthquakes. The idea that, again, that the longer you have in between earthquakes, the more energy built up, the worse the earthquake, so let's let off a little bit at a time. Uh, they, I know they've tried that. And people weren't really happy with more smaller earthquakes than one big one, as it turns out. Um, How can you even 
They were injecting um, uh, water into the joints, uh, kind of like fracking. Remember how fracking? If you guys again, if you pay attention to this stuff, fracking was uh, um, causing earthquakes, um, and because uh, they were putting the water back in, and and, and uh, it was a mess. It was a mess. So, uh, and then lastly, off to the upper, very upper right corner, you got Iceland there. Uh, but I think we pretty much talked about everything on here. Questions again? All right. Things you can make out of lava. I, I, I don't know what else to name this. As I started to explain earlier, um, when you got your pohoi hoi and your ah uh, ah, uh, they make, they I have to assume they make very unique looking rocks. Okay. So what we're going to show you are some some things that are left in the rock record that are made out of lava that look very unique. And perhaps that's what spawned my my pondering of pohoi hoi. <coughs> Columbia flood basalts. Um, flood basalts is the actual vocabulary word. The Columbia just happens to be this one. As the name implies, uh, it's a massive outpouring of lava. The earth cracks open and, and bleeds kind of thing. What's neat about this one is that um, this covers a good chunk of like four states um, and all the way down to the bottom and likely then some and all the way into the background that's all lava so this happened and it happened and it happened and it happened and it happened and actually as it turns out because it's um, igneous rocks which are really easy to date especially extrus of igneous rocks, they can tell you how many, I don't know the years, but they can tell you, you know, the oldest rock on the bottom, we get a date out of that. We go into, like I said, the, the, the background there, go to the top of the highest hill, date that one, and then assume a huge amount of erasing on top. Okay. It was very long eruption. Flood basalts are fairly common in the rock record. Um, if you study or read about the extinction of the dinosaurs, you may have heard of the Dakon Traps. Uh, that's over in Asia or Africa. I want to say it's over in China somewhere. Um, another huge one that's timed right around the extinction of the dinosaurs, so they were trying to blame that for a while. But it's just a massive outpouring of, of basalt. All right. It's hard to get scale. Um, And I can't even give you an image for scale, but you know I've always believed that down here at the very bottom, along the we'll call it a lake, um, those are full-size trees. Right? And again, these these spires over the waterfall here. That's my mouse. That those are the kind of things that Wiley Coyote falls off of and has a really long trip down. Um, um, also, the sign for you. Yeah, yikes or whatever. Yeah. Good. I'm glad you guys still know Blade Runner and Coyote. Short of physics, um, which isn't a, it's not a very good teacher of physics, um, it's great for the uh, Southwest imagery. Really neat stuff. So flood basalts. That's one thing you could do with lava, in case you were wondering. You got some spare lava. You need a lot of it, but you can do this. Laugh. What did I do? All right, lava domes. <clears throat> a lava dome is basically when the volcano seals itself off. As the name implies, it's dome shape. Um, and you might be thinking, oh, cool, good, seal that sucker up. That's better for us. Yeah, it's not. Um, the problem is, uh, actually, like we were just talking, you know, you, you want to be able to let off some steam, let off some gas. Um, 
these literally seal themselves up. It's, it's sort of, if you pardon the word, it's, it's sort of a, an organic cork. It, it grew into the volcano itself, crystallizing. Remember, if, if lava cooling turns into rock, well, this, this cork is growing inside of the volcano, literally, you know, gluing itself, crystallizing itself to the walls. It's a solid cork. That would probably be packing in the cold of the day, so. And, no, no, anywhere. Anyway, it doesn't have to be that. Um, just as the, as the heat and the pressure go away, it just sort of naturally happens. So, again, we've now got a nicely sealed off volcano. We're protected, right, and, until that heat and pressure come back. And because that's such an amazing cork, uh, quite often it, it blows out the side of the volcano um, instead of just blowing off the top. And um, it's a mess. And there's another thing that can happen. It's one of the very last things we talk about, and I'll refer back to this. Um, sort of a volcanic fart, if you would. Um, they're horrific, though. All right? Um, talk about SPDs. It's It's... They're, they're rough. Um, so volcanic lava dome is actually not good. Not good. Columnar jointing. Now if you look at this, you'd probably find yourself thinking, well, why don't they call it hexagonal somethings or whatever. Um, because what we really want you to look at is that or mm -hmm. that. All right, but we'll get to those in a minute. So columnar jointing is um, string cheese is the best example. Okay, um, when you do things right with string cheese, right the way God intended, you're peeling off these little pieces of cheese. All right. Well, imagine that each one of those were hexagonal. When you get into the middle, they almost sort of are, but. Um, this is deep down in our, in our volcano drawing over there. This is down in what we call the neck, all right? It's below the surface. It's between the, the pool of magma and the actual lava, and it's the deep bottom, the, the kernel, if you would, of the, the volcano itself. Um, and, and that's actually why, you know, thousands of years later when everything else is gone, they're still there. It was a very solid massive cooled body of rock all right but once it loses all that surround stuff i was there this is, i think this is my picture it's lost to time at this point but when you're at the base of this there's a sign that literally says okay ground level was you know 50 feet above the top of devil's tower so weathering and erosion has worn all that away so much easier than than that itself because again solid igneous rock versus you know sandstone but once all that's gone, this starts to fall apart. It starts to crack. So the way it cracks, back to the point finally, is in these hexagonal columns. Why crystallography? Who the heck knows? Okay, We talked about crystal shape and how it has some importance, not just in, in cleavage and this, that, and the other thing, but it tends to break this way. So imagine, let's leave the string cheese behind and let's move on to telephone poles. Okay, hexagonal telephone poles that are just sort of peeling off of this thing, and now we can maybe even throw in the blooming onion up here, uh, in visual image here. Okay, just falling off to the side, these things crack that way. Columnar jointing, it's the way lava breaks. Why is that rock hammer there? Just scale. Scale, okay. Just bad picture taker, forgot to get it out of the way. No, he's right, it's scale. All right, and the neat thing about that is um, that estuary, that's because you see the blue handle, you know it's an estuary, and um, you know that basically there's two uh, estuary hammers that, that, that we use uh, based on the amount of silver after the blue, that's the short handle. You now know the diameter of that rock, all right? Um, we take all kinds of field notes. We take all kinds of pictures. But God forbid the two of them ever meet by the time you get back to your office. All right. So one of the easy things we can do is, is try to uh, capture scale in our photos. Um, half of mine uh, have my foot in it. 
because I don't carry my rock hammer around like I used to. Um, but uh, you'll see pencils, you'll see lens caps. Lens caps are tough because they come in, you know, a couple different diameters, but um, uh, pencils aren't bad. But rock hammers, you know, most geologists out there in the field have on them. And like I said, we know there's two kinds. So it's there for scale. So columnar jointing, like I said, um, this is a side view of it. You see the, 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 the stuff that's fallen off over the years. This is probably the most famous one. Uh, it's a really old movie at this point, but Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Um, this is what the spaceship lands on in the end of the movie. Lands on top of Devil's Tower. I really think it would have collapsed it personally, but whatever. It's cool. It's not as tall as it looks. Again, I was there. I wasn't disappointed, don't get me wrong. But uh, when they take the photos, it always looks just, you know, skyscraper-ish. It's maybe, I don't know, four or five, six stories. It's not super big. This one, uh, a student asked me about, and I didn't, wasn't familiar with it. Um, so we Googled it one day, and that is really cool. Uh, again, most of my references are outdated. It reminds me of Qbert, okay, video game I loved playing as a kid. Um, and Qbert would hop up and down on these little uh, polygons, and uh, and that's what. It, and there you go. I haven't. I've tried Halo once or twice. I have too many buttons. Um, but yeah, so this is uh, Giants Causeway, Northern Ireland. Again, you know, back in the day, we thought up all kind of fantastical things, but this was basically just the neck of a, a volcano. But very cool looking. So columnar jointing. Columnar jointing. <coughs> Lava tube. Lava tube. Um, lava tubes are formed when a lava flow hits a body of water. Usually a coastline. A lot of water. What happens is the outside of it, because it um, hits the water, it, it cools rather quickly, crystallizes. Uh, but the inside, like a straw, keeps flowing. So the outside freezes, flows, freezes, flows. It, it like builds its own piping structure. okay, And then it eventually just kind of flows out. It runs through. So whether this is at sea level now, and it, it kind of looks like it is, the floor is wet, it kind of looks like some coastal rocks in the background there, um, or halfway up a mountain, we know that this had to be underwater when it formed, because that's the only way we see lava tubes forming. So that's kind of neat. It's something we could look at the rocks. We're gonna, you're going to see this trend as we go, especially in the sedimentary rocks. But again, volcanic rocks are a good part of that, that, that. These things are formed in an environment. And this is actually my end of geology. Um, minerals and, and, and rocks, a little bit. But surface structures and surface processes and, and critters and stuff, that's, that's what I do. Historical stuff. All right. So forensics, if you would. You're seeing this in the rock record. Again, it could be completely out of context, but you know that's how these things form. You have to assume, at least until evidence proves otherwise, that this was underwater when it happened. And that goes into conversations about sea level rise and so on and so forth, or uplift. Okay. Um, so the neat thing about this picture is it, uh, we always talk about advances in science thanks to technology. Um, I probably started using this picture as an overhead projector. Remember overheads? Uh, you guys maybe never even saw overheads, but it was this horribly bright light. You put these plastic sheets on it, and it would show uh, the image on the screen. So when I, back in those days, and even the early projector days, uh, I would say, see that line there? That line, that must be erosion. The water coming in, that's probably tide level. Tides out now, you see the ground's wet, and da 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 da. And I told a story about it. Well, then one year, 
one semester I walked in and realized that that ledge is going the other way. You could set a coffee cup on that. I thought it was an indentation for all those years because that's what it looked like. Resolution got better. I'm like, oh, crap. I've been lying to the last five years with students. Um, so what I'm thinking now is that this was actually sort of dug out and enhanced, if you would, for, for tourism and, and so on and so forth. Some state park, national park, whatever, come visit our lava tubes. Um, and to make it something you don't necessarily have to crawl through, they bored it out, dug it out in some way, shape, or form so you could actually walk through it. Um, or, that's an old lava level line. There's a handful of things that it could be. But, yeah. So again, person-ish for scale. People aren't great for scale because we come in a lot of different sizes. But you got a relative idea. That's at least a 10-foot tunnel. 12 if that person's 6 foot tall. They look like they got long legs. All these years I have no idea if it's a guy or a girl. But at any rate it's a person. And so we know, again, for scale, it's 10 to 12 feet tall. Pillow basalts. Pillow basalts. Anybody have a guinea pig? Seriously? Long time, Long time ago. Did you ever watch it poop? Uh, Not on purpose, but you've seen your guinea pig poop, right? I right. Never it. Yeah, I'm sure you did. The rest of you, go to Pet Smarts or Pet Supplies Plus. Watch a guinea pig poop. Just scare it until it starts pooping? Yeah, it will. You'll make it nervous and it'll poop, yeah. No. So, um, huh? Well, yeah, it might make you nervous and it couldn't poop. You're right. Guinea pigs are pretty skittish, though. They, yeah, they probably wouldn't have a problem with that. But, um, so, this has always made me think of guinea pig poop. I, I don't, I don't know why. Um, these two are formed underwater. And uh, uh, probably a better example for more people would be a hot tub. And what happens, uh, goat pellets are another, speaking of poop, we can talk about goats. Nobody owns goats, so guinea pigs are close. All right, anywho. So you know how in a jacuzzi, uh, what are those bubbles made out of? Why are there bubbles even there? What's happening to the water? Not quite. Not quite the right word. Huh? No, what's making the bubbles? The jets, yeah, air. They're blowing air into it. It's making it's, just, it's like you blowing bubbles in your chocolate milk, right? So the reason the bubbles form is because of water pressure. The air comes in, the water pressure sort of snips it off, and you get this little bubble coming. All right? And that's exactly what's happening at the end of a, of a guinea pig. That's why their poop doesn't look like your poop. And same thing with goats. You get those little pellets because of their sphincter muscles. So, imagine this. Underwater, you've got a lava vent opens up. And as the lava comes out, the water pressure sort of, pardon the term, pinches it off. And you get this little pellet of lava that rolls over to the side. And more comes out. And go boop, 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 boop. And... Before you know it, you've got this huge pile of these lava balls piling up around the vent. Now, of course, for the water pressure to be able to do that, it has to be at certain depth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So again, when we see these, let's say this guy isn't at the coast. He literally is halfway up a mountain. We know that at some point, this part of this cliff was under a decent amount of water. Enough water, as I said, that it would have the water pressure to, to pinch off these, these little balls. So pillow basalts. I would say beanbag basalts if it were me. If we named them in the 60s, we probably would have called them beanbag basalts or something like that. But uh, ottomans, I don't know, footstools. But they went with pillows. So if you're not following this, we're looking at these little round Structures in here. This gentleman's staring at these round structures. Yeah, it must have been a huge guinea pig. Yeah, it was. It was. This is where stark stories of giant dinosaur sized guinea pigs came from as well. Yeah. So, anywho, 
Yeah, I, I, I didn't mean to go the whole poop route, but I've been saying pinching off for years, and, and that makes many people think of that, and I don't know. So, there you go. Pillow basalts. So, we just picked a handful of uh, lava features, okay, that are out there in the world. Um, again, as I, as I mentioned, lava is, is, is unique, okay? Um, you change this, you change that, it changes its texture, it changes its appearance. Um, you put it in a different environment, it'll do this or that or the other thing. Um, there's there's dozens of, of different ways that lava can show up in the rock record. Okay, we just picked a handful to talk about. And again, uh, with the Pohoihoi and the uh, uh sort of separate from this conversation, but definitely great examples um, as well. So... Uh, I coming up here on not quite enough uh, time to to finish class, but uh, looking at this thing here, I've been talking to you for seventy five minutes, and that that's a lot of that's a lot of volcano volcano vocabulary words. So we're gonna call it quits for today, um, and pick up where we leave off on Thursday, and we should uh, finish this conversation.